Okay. okay. Um, good evening. Good evening, afternoon, morning, ladies and gentlemen, anywhere you are joining us from. We know that this is a global platform now. Is our town hall meeting uh, um, the 12th edition? We started sometimes last year. I think since we started, we have only um, omitted only one month. And for the, that month, we were having another program that is women working with children. We felt that we should not um, plug you with so many programs. So we decided to uh, you know, not have that month. But every month, we have addressed diverse kinds of topics. Now, my guest today who are with me on this program is not their first time on the program. As a matter of fact, they are part and parcel of what we do. These are people that, um, you know, they are in the background sometimes um, and they are doing a lot. They are members of our faculty. And so we have addressed diverse topics. So Olabisi has been with us before on this program. Um, Mrs. Ayayeni has been with us you know, on this program, and other members of our faculty has joined us at different times. But we felt that when we do programs like this, it is important for us to have back. There's a lot we have said. There's a lot we, a lot of times we think we even know the mind of the people. But we felt it is time to reach out to you that have been joining us for the past 12 months. You know, I know people who have not missed one meeting. And I don't want to begin to mention their names because when I get into name mentioning, I get into trouble because I'm definitely going to forget some people who have also been joining us from time to time. And so there are people who have been with us since the beginning. There are people mobilized for this program. So we feel that we need, we need feedback. We want to know how you are thinking. What are you thinking? What is in your mind? So we decided to call today Open House, Open House Party, you know, and we want you to ask your questions. Um, so we have deluge of questions, questions poured in like rain, you know, and um, as our last count, as of this morning, we have had like 27 questions. And we have tried to group these questions. And these are each of these questions, looking at them, they are symposium discussions. They are loaded. For example, somebody is asking is that, what does good parenting entail? That's a book. You know, how do you do that in one hour, in one hour 30 minutes? Uh, people are asking about sexuality, education, the whole lot. And we feel that, you know, the way the program was to go before Olabi Seafolabi was to moderate and take the, but when I looked at the legion and the deluge of questions, we said, okay, let's try to see, we can answer 27 questions. We try to group them. It's just that each question is just distinct and grouping is a bit difficult, but we say, okay, where do we go from here? What to do is to see what we consider to be topmost questions. And please note, every question is going to be answered. It might not be in this uh, meeting. It may be that we are going to find time to, instead of going 12 months before asking for questions, maybe after every two editions, we do an open house so that we can clear questions. I believe that if we have been doing that, we, know, we may not have this deluge you know, of questions that we are dealing with. So thank you very much for joining us. I have with me, Mrs. Ayuayeni. Mrs. Ayuayeni is a veteran. is an unusual person. Uh, she's a parent. She's raising unique children. You know, I was seeing one of the videos, you know, of her daughter making a pitch. I said, a fruit or fruit does not fall far away from the tree. I'm not surprised at the exploits the daughters are doing. Uh, she's joining us today to take these questions. Olabi Seafolabi is a veteran. I mean, Olabi Seafolabi is in the space, uh, one of the most insightful people in the space created many ideas, you know, for, she worked with us, you know, di uh, uh, directly, because she still worked with us indirectly now. I mean, she was with us days to day to five, for five years or thereabouts, and she gave all, you know, the only thing she, she was telling me uh, this weekend, I said, sir, I gave all to that project, I said, but you didn't give your life. If you have given your life, you, would, <laughs> you won't be here, that you are still here, means you still left something that you did not give. So, 
Olabi self Olabi, with Olabi self Olabi, there's no half measures. Okay. She's committed to this cause. And so in the background, you know, helping us to navigate is my dearly beloved wife, Mrs. Um, Olua Fumilayo Akinlami, uh, very, very committed to this cause, very insightful, unusually gifted to understand the issues. I even sometimes when I'm trying to ramble, I'm trying to understand what the issues are, is crystal to her. And she brings those to table. Uh, uh, for some reason, she's not able to join us. You know, we're not able to project her today. And, um, but she's behind the scene working with us to make sure that this works. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Akinlami for joining us today. Yes, let's go right into it. Uh, we have questions, a lot of questions. I'm gonna start by um, <laughs> my, I'm gonna start by um, taking the first question. As a matter of fact, the phone where the question is, my son has confiscated it. <laughs> I'm trying to get it from him. He has, he has, he's holding it now. There's no way um, if the ED can help us to arrest the situation, I will appreciate it. So um, what do I do from now? Uh -huh. So what do I do? Um, so Ms. Olabisi, let's take some words of introduction from you. I will also do the same thing with Mrs. Ayayani that we take it from there. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you. So Olabisi right. goes first. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Ms. Ayayani. Good evening to everyone watching. Good evening to the ED. Good evening to the team at the background. Um, first to say is that it's my utmost honor to be here. Um, I keep saying that I, I still do not know anyone as much as you know, I've been in this work for a while now. I don't know many people who are, you know, holistic about child protection, passionate and um, all around genuine about the interest of children without any ulterior motive. You know, working with you personally, so I've seen situations where you know, it, it comes to question where, where, where your where priority or interest really stand. Is it for the children? Is it for gains? Is it for money? And I see that time and time again, even when it can be injurious to your um, yourself, your reputation, you, you always take the stand for children. And um, for me, that has instructed me in more ways that, uh, that I can imagine. And I'm happy that is in area, sir. <laughs> you really know, so you can send me this one. Um, thank you so much for um, all that you do for children. I think that the work that you do um, kind of, you know, sets the pace and makes us, make us know that we cannot give up on the system. Because personally, you know, um, leading up to, the, to this program, I have been dealing with some cases that just make me, made me, you know, want to say, what well, this is what we're doing. You know, there are a lot of bottlenecks, a lot of issues with government, a lot of issues with regulations, a lot of issues with, with humans that are actually running, you know, protection for children. And um, it looks like, are we making progress? Do we take two steps forward and one step backward? But I realized that um, in, well, in in a particular project, when we, when we are watering the field, like when we're actually doing our work regularly, the only foreseeable consequences that will have some level of impact breaking through in different places. So, um. It, it, it's very encouraged to do more. We're encouraged to keep having these conversations because I imagine that with conversations we are here now. So I now imagine that without these conversations, I wonder, you know, the, where the state of our children will be at the moment. So I appreciate this kind of conversations. I, I recognize that this is what we need at the moment, among amongst other things. And you know, this conversation sets the sets the pace for action. You know, it, it, it sets a the hunger in people, it makes them also see possibilities that, you know what, this transportation thing is doable. It's not abstract. It's not out of the blues. We can all do it together, working together. So thank you very much for the platform. And uh, that's my opening speech for this um, program today. Thank you, sir. Labi for Labi cuts the picture of um, Naomi Campbell at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> at the same time, um, the last time I saw her, she was promoting natural African air. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Abuja is a way of uh, causing trouble. Well, obviously, we are watching you. So, Mrs. Ayayani, your, oh, your opening remarks, please. Let's take your opening remarks. 
Well, good evening, everyone. Like, I mean, Olavisi has spoken, she has said everything in my heart, but I want to quickly add that it's always very humbling, you know, to be on platforms like this and be working with children is one of the most humbling things that I know because you are constantly racing against so many things and because of the kind of world we live in. So even within the faculty, there's been a lot of apathy, you know, as Ms. Olabisi said, as to are we even making any progress? Is it even worth the work? The pressure, the burden is so much. It doesn't seem to be reducing. It seems to be getting worse. But as she said, I mean, we can't stop talking about it. Like we encourage ourselves, we will feel discouraged and then we encourage ourselves and we keep the conversations going. We cannot stop talking about it. We can't get tired. We can't give up. So these conversations are very precious to me as a person. And I am just humbled, you know, to be part of this. Thank you, Mr. Kinnan. Thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'll ask my first question. And um, my first question will go to, uh, there are four questions, you know, a mark to be answered by Ms. Olabisi Afolabi. So I, I see four questions, am I correct, uh, Ms. Afolabi? I see four questions are marked for you here. So let me start with the first one. And I will appreciate that if we keep each response to like three minutes or whatever, so we can take as many questions as possible, just as much as possible straight to the point. Please be yourself, illustrate when it is necessary. Let's bring to table because a lot of time illustration is the is the is the oil with which you know principles are eaten. You know, we're able to give illustration as people to understand the issues better. Uh, so um so um the first question: how do we ensure that we are able to prevent and protect our precious children from all forms of abuse, child abuse. How do we ensure that we're able to protect our precious children from all forms of abuse? Um, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, sir. Well, that question is a very, a very holistic one and a very broad one because that's all that we're about here, child protection. How do we achieve it? Well, I'll say that there are many, um, many parts to this and there are many factions to this. And um, every faction, every I think in Taiwan, I mean, faculty, we usually call it um, the four rings of protection, people that are involved in this thing. So how do we achieve protection is that all the four rings work together to achieve protection. Now, so we need to know the four rings. We need to know what their roles are. So it simply means that if everybody plays their role, we are gonna be good. Now, how do we even know our role? That is awareness, that is, that is empowerment, conversations like this, you know, when, we all know what to do in the first place. Now, what, what are the four rings? We talk about the family, we talk about the community, we talk about um, the government, the state, we talk about international community. So the family, you know, first of all, um, has a duty to inculcate positive value system in children. So the family is where the children first learn everything they know about their lives and protection. They learn how you know, they should be addressed, in terms of talking to them, you know, how the first, the first, um, the first voice a child hears is the voice of is our parents at home. We see it, we see when children speak outside, you know, and I, I have children, I know that this child at home hear this, hears this kind of voice, this is the kind of values that this child is learning from home. So protection is not an exception. So the values of where to go, where not to go, what to say, um, for example, on the internet, you know, what are the values that guide you offline, online? They learn this primarily from the family. I have the community. The community talks about um, the society, the schools, they go to the mosque, the church, the immediate community that a child belongs to. What role do they need to play in child protection? The third one is the state, the government. You know, um, what roles do they have to play in protection? And the fourth one is the entire community. So the family has to play to, to inculcate a positive value system. The community has a role to reinforce what a child is learning in the family. So the child goes to, the child goes to school, and is not, you know, learning something entirely different from what she's learning at home, is still appropriately working together to achieve the more protection. The, the government works to create not just um, not just policies, create policies, create laws, see that they are enforced, you know, not the critical enforcement. You know, for example, I, I walk on the street of Lagos and I see children on the street of Lagos, like a parent flagrant abuse, children are, they are, they are doing conductor work, they are on the road, they are sitting, you see some of them begging, and what is the um 
what, what, what is the commitment to see those kind of children off the street? Because sometimes, you know, we have this privileged conversation with parents, with schools, you know, keep children safe, this and that. But these are children who are on the streets where there's no level of, where, where is the connection? Where is the hope for them, you know, in this conversation? What I think governments should do, play their role in seeing that every child, the common child, wherever they are, can get protection. And lastly, the national communities, they create, you know, even superior policies and support the state. So if the family plays their role by getting em empowerment, by knowing that children have rights, they are persons, there's a way they should be treated, you know, and they teach the children as well. So all of us play our role as the four rings, and we then empower the children to know about their sexuality, to know about their rights, to be able to recognize when abuse is taking place. We as parents, as school, as government, as other community, we also know that these are the rights of children. These are what causes abuse. And we all work together and empower the children. I believe that we're taking the first step towards child protection um, and pre uh, preventing it at all costs in our communities. Thank you so much, sir. But Ms. Olabisi, that is deep. I mean, I mean, it, it, it takes into cognizance everything that matters. You know, because you see, at the end of the day, it is about, you know, uh, knowing what to do. And even when you don't know what to do, know who to call. You see, because knowledge is power. Uh, but beyond that, what we practice is what we know. You know, uh, Mr. Alakulation, we always say, what you can do is what you can do. What you cannot do, you cannot do. So it is important that we understand that. I believe the person who has that question has been fully briefed because there is more to protecting our children than lip service. So I want to go to Mrs. Ayoyeni very quickly. Uh, Mrs. Ayoyeni, there are eight questions that are marked for you here. Um, let me uh, ask you the first one. Uh, it says, schools that run a school bus system should have a policy on the kind of music that the drivers play to the hearing of children. What is the solution to the continuous breach of a duty of care by school? So, I mean, I think these questions are two in one. I've attended, I've in, in working with schools, we have attended programs where parents have complained about the kind of music that drivers play for their children because they say these children come on and begin to sing some songs that they know that the children did not hear from them in, in their environment, you know, within, the, within their environment. So I want to ask, how do we do that? Please speak to us from your experience. Then again, I think it's two questions. I said, what is the solution to the continuous breach of duty of care by schools? Well, um, that's such a fantastic question because I, I know that it may sound so trivial, like what, what has music got to do with anything? But we understand from the children we are raising, pop culture is everything. Most of the things that is popular culture for a reason, most of the things that we don't, so you see children who would sing songs or behave in certain ways that is not um, um, in in, uh, co in coordination with what you are laying for them at home. They learned it from somewhere because the society in which they are raised, children are not raised in a bubble. So I really appreciate the person that asked that question in terms of music. I have been a primary complainant of this. And so when you were reading the question, I was just smiling. I complained bitterly because it's not even just about the music in the school bus. It's the appropriateness of the program. You see some of these um, drivers, they listen to radio. They don't know any better. They will turn on the radio. The program's going on, the conversation's going on. May not even be child-friendly. Could be something talking about, you know, things that are just not ch child appropriate. So I personally have had this conversation with my with my uh, my children's school. I've had to pull them out of the school bus. It cost me tears and blood because school runs is not for the faint-hearted. But that was my own first response to say, okay, while you are dealing with this, can we, you know, can I just remove my children? And so let me let me know where our issues are coming from, you know. So basically, I think that it's, it depends on how committed. So. Um, uh, Ms. Olabisi was talking about, you know, the value system of the home. It depends on how committed we are to these things. Do we even see it as a big deal? So many people would, would play music and just say, oh, it's just a child, oh, it will matter, you know. So that's the first foundation of it. How committed is the school or the school bus uh, provide, service provider or the people involved? Even the parents, maybe in a school bus of 30, maybe it's only this one parent now that thinks it's a problem. 
you know, so that's that's the foundation. So how do we even see, do we even first of all identify that this is a problem? That's the first question. And if they are not identifying, and if you as the one parent is identifying it, then you owe it as a responsibility to your child and all the other children to speak up, to say, well, um, I'm sorry, I think this is wrong for X and Y and Z reasons, and I think that this should be looked into. That's what I did. And I, I, I made that point by first of all, pulling out my children from the bus service. As I said, it was not easy, but I made that difficult decision. So those are things that we can do, first of all, as primary caregivers. Then we have this conversation with the school. We want to know where, where, where does the school stand on this? Is it that you guys are not aware? Is it that you guys, you know, it's just an oversight? You don't understand the, you know, bigger implications of things like music, you know, in the life of a child, something that you hear over and over. It's the same way, they, they, it's the same process that they learned multiplication table, that content of music will seep and sit in their minds. All of us learn multiplication table by reciting it, by hearing it every single day. And we know it by heart now without thinking we know it. That's exactly the same method or the same impact that music. And we all know the, you know, the content of the music that is in circulation in our society. You know, so it's important that first of all, we start from our value systems. So we start from helping our children to even be, to, to be able to identify what is, is this content even good or bad? Is this good content or bad content? So we're, we're even talking about music, it could, even, it could even be comedy. We've seen comedians laugh at child molestation situations and thought it was a joke. They thought That's it was okay to laugh at, at cases of rape. They thought it was a joke to laugh at children that stammer. They use them as case study in their entire conversation, mm -hmm. you know, in their entire, I don't know, in their entire show as it were. They ask kids. You said, yeah, in their hand, they ask kids, all those <laughs> kinds of things. I'm so alarmed. So there's so much going on and these things are forming a foundation in the minds of our children. That's why you see somebody, somebody falls down and it, the first thing children do is laugh. You know, because it's becoming part of their orientation, their, their socialization as it were. So it's critical. Music, pop culture, comedy, all these things, entertainment is critical in the socialization of our children. And all the stakeholders must be made to know this. So we talked to the school bus. So in my case, I spoke to the school bus service providers. Unfortunately, my own children's school don't do the, the school bus services outsourced. And this led to a whole process whereby you know you are able to speak up other parents are able to say hmm, it's true i didn't think about it because at the end of the day everybody wants their children to do well so being that voice where everybody seems to be sleeping is one of the first um you know um solution to this be that voice gather as many other parents as you can so that you make the voice stronger speak to the school authority about it as we speak now the school had to go back to the drawing board they had to get involved they had to do like a, they, they now have this MOU. They sent it back to parents. We had a school bus committee set up. Wow. That's how detailed the issue went. Because other parents began to say, ah, it's true, ah, it's true. You know, everybody, everybody started to speak up. So they said, because before they would stay aloof and say, well, it's our source, blah, blah, blah. So, no, we are, we are using the school bus because we are children and your school. If my children was next door, they would not have access to these people. So be that voice. Gather as many people as you can to make the voice stronger. Ensure that you hold the school accountable. And I'm, I'm telling you, when a lot of parents are talking about an issue, the school will have no choice. They will attend to it. Even if it is the school bus, boycott them if you must. Form association, all the people living in Uju Elegba, start doing the school runs by. So there are so many ways that we can address this. I'm sorry, sir. I think I missed the second part of the question. No, it's a, a consistent breach. When a school is consistently breaching uh, um, so he said, what is the solution to the continuous breach of duty of care by schools? It's the same procedure. It's the same process. Be that voice. I mean, you may be labeled as this woman. I own is too much. Please don't mind them, my sister. It is my brother. These are your mm -hmm. children. Their lives are, they are only the students of the school for six years. They are yours forever. So be mm -hmm. that voice. Speak up. Speak to other parents that are like-minded. Make sure that you have a strong voice and address the school. You know, when they start seeing that it's as if half of our children are going to go, they will sit up. I promise you that. And if they don't, please find another school that aligns with your values. You know, mm. so these are, these are some of the things that we can, we can really do. Great, great, great. Um, thank you for your response. As you are speaking, I, I see that Whatever recommendation we want to bring requires a duty from us. Mm. Unfortunately, that is where we fail. 
that place of, so when people need a solution, they need a solution as, that does not include them. Hmm. If this problem can be solved without me, me, man, to shut down, to, to withdraw children from school runs and begin to drop them yourself. Wow. That is where the duty is. That is where the responsibility is. But the question is, are we ready to pay the price? In this matters, everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. And it reminds me of a pathetic story of a woman who told me in Ipadu that the principal of her child's school told the children to taste pupu. The pupu, they call it feces. Until his son revolted and said, no, 13 year old. I said, no, I cannot. I cannot taste it. And it was that boy, 13 year old boy that sparked the um, decent voices among the children. And he said, no, we are not going to taste food. No, we are not going to do that. And so I asked the woman, is your child still in this? He said, he's there. I said, I said they've dealt with that woman, Mr. Kilami. Hey, he can, she can never try it again in her life. I said, okay. I said, I don't have a problem with the father. Your child is still there. Is the woman still there? He said, he's there. He's still there. And the woman is still there. I said, what was done to her? He said, she was warned. According to what? Is there a policy in place? Is there a process in place? They just told her, they just warned her. Say yes. Say, but the ultimate is that I'm busy, the father is busy. When are we going to have time to go and look for another school? So because of that, now I'm not saying that if there's a crisis in the school, you remove your child. That's what I'm saying. But I'm saying that is there a mechanism in place to prevent and if for whatever reason, the mechanism to prevent fails, is there a mechanism in place to respond? In my conversation with the woman, the mechanism to prevent did not exist. The mechanism to respond did not exist, but she still kept her child there. Why did she keep the child there? Because she cannot do the work that is required for her to do to protect her child. You see the issue now? A lot of times, the problem is not with knowing what to do. The problem is with doing what we know to do. That's why we say that there are three things critical. When you are working with children, you need attitude. I used to say knowledge, skill, and attitude. I put attitude for, but now I've put attitude in front. Attitude is the fortitude to do that which you know you should do. Attitude comes first. You know, when a matter happens, the kind of people you go for, for advice, shows the kind of answer that you want because you know, you know people's disposition. And so let me add a bit to this equal school, issue of school runs. School runs is part of child safeguarding and protection policy of a school. Child safeguarding and protection system codified into policy of a school. School runs is part of it. The same way you have things like safer recruitment. The same way you have things like online protection. The same thing, uh, you have um, um, digital protection. You have all of these things. The same thing, you have mechanism for responding to cases. The same way you have bullying. School runs protocol is supposed to be a chapter, a part of our can testify to that when we work with schools to develop policies. School runs is a major part of it. And what do we use? There is a document released by um, Road Safety Organization of Nigeria and, and um, Standard Organization of Nigeria. It's road Safety, Federal Road Safety and Standard Organization of Nigeria. Do you know by that policy, every school bus must have two drivers per time, a lead driver and an assistant driver. Do you know that the school runs officer cannot substitute as that second driver? And do you know that that second driver cannot substitute as the school runs officer? Do you know that you cannot run a school, you cannot run a bus, you cannot use a bus for school runs 
without alternative door of escape. Any bus that has only one door cannot be used. There has to be double doors. One is permanently shut because of safety. The other one is open. In case there is an emergency, which we call lack of coping, copy, sorry, which we call lack, lack of coping capacity. In case there's an emergency, you're able to open that other door and children are able to go out. You can, as a matter of fact, you cannot use a bus to do school runs without double doors. But how many schools that you know, and how many school buses that you know has those double doors? How many? People use Costa. Does Costa have double doors? Where is the, as a matter of fact, when it comes to children, for example, church buildings, school buildings, do you know that if you want, to, there has to be another door, exit door, emergency door. The same way it must happen in the, it must be in the bus, it must be in the classrooms. And if it cannot be in the classroom, it must be on the doorway that if children come out, if you do uh, what we call, um, um, if you if you do if you do um, what do you call this thing now? If you if you do if you call out children, if you do what did you call um, a drill? Drill, yes. If you do a drill, when children come out, people cannot. The more entrances, the more exits that they have to go out, the better. Any building that is what its name in today's world pays attention to possibility of exit in the case of emergency. So these are realities that we need to know. And these are realities that we need to bring to the table. Let me tell you something. The unfortunate thing that we are dealing with today is that these things that we are talking about, many schools don't know, parents don't know, and so it's a free for all, all fall. And so it is important therefore that we pay attention to details. The devil in the issue of child protection, I continue to say the devil is in the details that we neglect because those details always tear us, us in the face. If a school continues to flout, in, to flout duty of care, you warn, you relate, you talk. What they are telling you is that we are not worthy of your children. But the question is, are you ready to go that, to go that route? Are you ready to even challenge what you believe to be wrong? Um, till last week, we were challenging things. Olabisi brought a case to my attention. Olabisi was the one handling that case. We were challenging status quo. Do you know status quo did not see what we saw? We're dealing with emergency. Status quo said we should go and wait it tomorrow. Olabisi come and say, Olabisi, but you know we can't. He said, I know, sir. We can't wait it tomorrow. But status quo is an highly placed, highly placed, we are talking about highly placed organizations who we believe should know better. But they were telling us to hold on. But we knew when it comes to child protection, time is of the essence. Prevention is more better than cure. Now, when there's a case, the early response is the way to go. But that night, Olabisi did not go to bed. We began to make calls. We began to, finally, we were able to get a response that night. Why were, we, why were we able to get response? Because we know better. Because we are committed to the cause of these children. So, because status quo says, tomorrow we'll discuss it. We can't pressure status quo. Status quo is set. Status quo is a system. You can't pressure them. When you pressure them, they will switch off their phone. When you can't reach them again, you will, you will go and sleep. But to like, to like Olabis is 2 a.m., which was my, you know, that time we're still talking. Till late in the night, and we're able to get help. After getting help for the woman, Stato Sko showed up. But they pressuring the woman to give up her case. She give up the case. And Stato Sko has surrendered her with all the paraphernalia that we encouraged her to give up her case. Then we said, 
We are going to reach out to people who are not for status quo. We are going to call them. Malabi put the call through. After five minutes, she called me and said, sir, ha, it's the same. Even the people that were supposed to be against status quo, they are saying that, they are saying this, they are saying this, they are saying that. I said, wow, what do we do? I said, I suspected it. When the people that are trained to defend the children are the same people who are hobnobbing with those who are oppressing the children, it's a major issue, my people. So these are issues. Let me go to our next question. And our next question is going to be going to Ms. Olabisi. Uh, the next question says, not all schools have a child safeguarding and protection policy in place. What is the solution to this? Wow. Um, thank you so much, sir. You know, um, on this particular issue, um, I feel like I was talking to a friend recently about this issue of, of safety in schools. And they were like, okay, you know what? They feel like this issue has not been very well announced. Like a lot of schools, a lot of people don't know about um, child protection yet. And, you know, I asked myself that if individuals, maybe somebody somewhere says they don't know about child protection, it shouldn't, it can, it can, it shouldn't in a, in, in a, in a normal, in normal circumstances, it cannot be schools. Because um, what we have here is, uh, is the reverse way things should go. It, what we have is that people only have child safeguarding policies when it has become um, a necessity, when something has, something has happened and then they're trying to react to it. And the whole essence of safeguarding system is that we want to be proactive, right? We want to think ahead. You know, as I always say in Tawaklami Academy, care is that you look at possible problems, possible threats to children, you look at possible needs that they may have. That means the needs have not yet come. The threats have not yet come. But you are thinking ahead and saying, okay, what are the threats? What are the risks involved in taking care of the children in our school? We do assessment for every program. We do safe recruitment. We do everything in thinking ahead of everything that's going to happen. So when we don't have a safeguarding system, what we're basically doing is that we are already, you know, putting the children at risk. The children are not just at risk. We are putting them at risk. Now, so a lot of schools don't have this um, policy. My question is, how are these schools registered? Are these schools, are, are they existing? Are they operating in oblivion? Are there people, is it that the government is not aware that these schools exist? We have a record of about 18,000 um, private schools in Lagos, for example, including public schools, on that, which is on the other side of the story. Right. So this um, private schools, what, 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 what is the regulation for them? What's the regulatory process? What's the process of onboarding? How do you set up a school in Lagos? How do you start the school? You know, we shouldn't be having these conversations at this point that the school doesn't have a safety policy. It should not be the case because that should be a major, 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 um, major criteria for you to start a school in the first place because it's not possible for there to be a school and there will be no incidences. Things will happen because we're dealing with children, dealing with people. So to, to forestall that and to respond to that ahead, there has to be a policy. So one of the regulatory documents we should have before in the school in Nigeria, in Lagos State, everywhere we are, it should be having a safeguarding system. So I'll uh, just our, our, our question is that we need to go back to drawing board as a regulatory body, as a government, to see that every school in Lagos State, what exists right now, there's a child protection policy for Lagos State in 2016. What, how is it being run in various schools? Well, are we checking? Who is checking? Who is in charge? So somebody needs to be in charge. A body needs to go around and ensure that people really have protection policy. Another aspect of this, as I said before, all hands have to be on deck. Now, parents register their children in school every blessed day. Every day a new child is born in Nigeria. In, in, and these children have a right to education. They should go to school, both, pri both private and public. And very close to the right to education of children is the right to protection. Because a child that goes to a school where there's no protection uh, literally does not have the right to education. Because education cannot take place effectively in that, that, that kind of environment. So two rights have been denied, right to protection, right to education. So as a parent, when we are our children in school, we need to ask questions, very important questions. What do you have a safeguarding structure in your school? When you go there yourself, you look at the culture, how do you talk to other staff? I've been to a school in Lagos State, went to go and train somewhere. And I remember going with Mr. Ayayene, I told them, just by coming to this school, I can tell 
that they have a very friendly culture. They didn't know who I was as I came in. Somebody greeted me so warmly. I saw how they interacted with each other. It was a warm environment. You, you could tell that here, there's care, there's nurturing, right? So you, when you go around your child in the school, ask questions. Do you have a policy? Are your, are your staff trained on this policy? Do you know about it? How does it work? Where is it? Where is it located? Where is it? Can I see it? Then you check the culture yourself. Ask questions from other parents that have children in the school. So, because sometimes I, you know, when things happen, I go on social media. I see comments like millions of thousands of comments, and I'm like, everybody on this comment section, that are children are in schools. Do you, do, do your children, do the school have child children policies? So, as Mr. Kalami said, we all have to play our role. So, what solution to this? Solution is that there has to be a regulation because we cannot depend on people's goodwill to do the to do the right thing. I can't just hope that the school who have a policy and if they don't have it it's fine you know that's the regulation that's the check that's the enforcement that's the somebody going around the schools from time to time as we updated somebody they are reporting to a place that we can check number two is that parents have to you know check these things themselves why, why you don't see that don't worry your child we are we are the customers in fact we are enablers when we see these things and turn a blind eye to it so that's how i'll be saying for now um, we cannot just leave this to chance we can't leave this to good of people we need to take these actions regulatory why is also parents need to play the role in ensuring that no child goes to a school where there's no safeguarding system. Thank you, sir. Good. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Olabisi. So when you look at, um, and thank you for doing exceptional justice to that question. Now, let me take it from there. When you look at, when I went to school, I turned 53 yesterday. So I went to school many years ago. When I, I was, I went to public primary school, public secondary school, public university. I went to Lagos State University. My school fees throughout when I graduated was 99. And we had a law library to ourselves. You know, that same school became 250,000 at the time in Lagos State. So that's the school I went to. And um, so the government was responsible for my education to a very large extent. There was no way I could have gone to school with the kind of, um, you know, finances that my parents had if schools were like this today where you have to give an arm and a leg for you to be able to send children to school. There was no way my father was going to be able to afford it. And so I went to school. Note that the role of government in school is to fund and to regulate. So now today, those schools that I went to, mm. they still exist, but the population has increased. Mm. But because population has increased and government has not grown with the population in terms of building infrastructure. So as of today, we have 13.5 million Nigerians. No, as according to, according to UNESCO, now it's 18 point something million Nigerian, out of, Nigerian children out of school are predicted. Even if a ninja becomes the president of Nigeria tomorrow, we have to, if you are going to return 18.5 18 million children to school, we have to find another way. It cannot be brick and mortar. There has to be another way by which we want to accelerate because th the destiny of those 18 million cannot wait. Hmm. They keep increasing. There has to be something beyond brick and mortar that will deliver education to these children. You know, because that's the way to be looking at it. But let me focus on the issue we are discussing, which is child protection system within the school system. So now we have a situation where School government plays the role of regulation. Government plays the role of um, funding. Uh, of funding. That funding part, government has dropped the ball all over Nigeria. Dropped the ball because government dropped the ball. They are not creating more school, more infrastructure that we cope with in population it's increase. Mm. Private school sprang up. So primary and secondary education in Nigeria today from nursery, primary and secondary education today in Nigeria is largely in the hands of the private sector. Very well, sir. The fact that that has happened is a failure. Mm, mm. It's a proof of a failure of the state in living up to its duty. Population increment did not fall upon us like a thief in the night. It's a lack of planning. So now, an organization plays two roles, funding and regulation. 
They've dropped the ball in funding. We've seen it. So private schools began to spring up. So we took our children to private schools, those of us who can afford it. Those who can now afford it are the 18.5 million that their children are out of school. Now, those of us who can afford private school, we took our children there. And I want you to believe that private school has levels, grade one, grade B, grade C, grade D, grades of private school. So even those who are in public school, we are not sure of the kind of education they are receiving. Mm. Now, those who are also in the private school, we are not sure to a very large extent. So now, there are private schools that have stood out in all of this. But this is the point I want to make to you if you are listening to me. Since government, the same government that has two legs, one leg is for funding, another leg is for regulation. That leg that is for funding has withered away for many years now. So the government is working with one leg or regulation. You now trust them to use that one leg that is left to do well in private school. Private schools is a reflection of their failure. Private schools should exist, but it should not exist as an alternative hmm. to public schools. It should be that those who want luxury, who want a type of ambience, will take their children to private school for whatever they are looking for there. It cannot be because we're in private school because there's no public school. That is what is happening in Nigeria. So if you now become the regulatory body, if the regulatory body has failed in funding, has created private school, you as the parent, you must become the regulators of the private school. You must become the regulators of the private school. That is why you must ask questions. Where is your child protection system codified into policy, broken down into processes on which everybody within the school system is trained? Where is it? Want to see it? When was it drafted? Which consultant supported you to draft it? When was it reviewed? Are your staff trained? Because training, let me tell you something, is the soul of child protection system. Training is the soul. It's the most critical, really. You create system, you create processes, you create all of that. What about attitude? Attitude is the reason why people have policy, they don't use it. Hmm. Attitude is the reason why policy is there, but they still go and do contrary to the policy. It's not enough for you to have policy. But if your attitude is of thinking that all will be well, how are you going to be there to do the needful? You don't need to see threat coming. You just need to do the needful, you know? So basically, in a, that's in addition to what, so the bulk agitation, when we talk about these issues, we tell government, those who come to equity must come with clients. You can't be telling school about child protection policy and all of that, and none of your school has. Yes, yes. And your schools don't have. So you must go, go and fix your school. That is where you have a good place to stand and say, oh yeah, Schools should do their own. Then we as parents, we have a responsibility because the devil is always in the details. You must insist. Please, I want to see your child protection system codified into policy, broken down into processes on which everybody is trained and is done, you know, uh, uh, periodically. There's a trip that schools were trying to make when we looked at their risk analysis, we insisted the children cannot make this trip. The, children, this, the trip, they are not ready. Thank God they listened to us. A lot of issues also happen, but the children did not end up making the trip. It's a blessing in disguise because once your risk analysis is not sure, and let me give you a quick example. You want to take children out of this country. With what we now know, you can't take children out of this country to a hotel that does not have child protection system, codified into policy, broken down into processes, on which everybody is trained, does the hotel have the habit of hosting children? When they host children, how do they function? What is their disposition towards children? You can't just take children to a hotel and say, uh, uh, it's a hotel that we want to use. 
these are fundamental issues that you know we don't normally look at. But when schools engage us, we take a look at your risk analysis. We give you a, 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 a we tell you these are the things that are possible, these are the things that are not possible. You know, I'll ask the next question. I'll obviously took the last question, so I go to Mrs. Ayayeni. Uh, what does the term proper parenting entail? Mrs. Ayayeni, the term proper parenting, what does it entail? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um... So let me let me let me join with the next question because it's like they are together. He okay. said, How do parents go about acquiring the appropriate knowledge, skill, and attitude? needed to ensure the child protection of children? Well, I, I think the, the second question is a, is a good addendum to the first one because that's the first thing you do. You go ahead and acquire the skill, first of all. Like Mr. Olakunle um, uh, Shorinya would say, he would say that you can sincerely go to jail. Like you, you can't do things out of the sincerity of your heart, you know, and that's one. Another thing I learned from him is that you don't um, wish things into existence. So he would say, you can't become a lawyer and say, oh, I just love this law profession so badly. And then you sleep and wake up and God will say, ah, this girl loves law so much. Let me just confer on, on her law or being a lawyer or being a barrister. If other things in life don't happen that way, it's very foolhardy for us as parents to just assume that we will give birth to children and then we will become experts at parenting. Everything requires getting knowledge. So the person that asked the second question, I thank you because is like the answer to the first one. And there is no, there is no, I don't know that there is like a general proper parenting, but there is principles that applies to everything. And the first is get knowledge. Like we cannot even, we can't even jump that um, phase. I was at a position in my life where I, I told myself that you need to go and find this knowledge, wherever it is, find it. And, and um, God kind of directs the desires of our hearts because by pure chance, somehow I met Mr. Kinlami, I met people like Prince Fouwe, I met people like um, uh, Mr. Olakunle Shorinyo, and by extension, I met people like um, Mrs. Akinlami as well. And after a while, when you when you deliberately seek something out, you will begin to find that you are getting it. You know, I, I don't know who used this analogy that if you really like Range Rover, somehow you will begin to see Range Rover everywhere. It's a, it's a game of mind. So your mind also directs us in that way. So it's important that we find, we don't assume that by the virtue of giving birth to children, we automatically know what to do. We gave birth to the children means that we now have children. We are now mothers or fathers. The next phase is I need to deliberately seek out how to raise these children, how to parent them. I need to learn of the child, like Mr. King Lamy will say. We are constantly thinking that we are teaching children, but there is also the angle of learning of the child and learning from the child. It's so multifaceted that I'm not sure that I know how to summarize what proper parenting would entail, but the first thing is we need to seek out knowledge. Please do not assume that by just the virtue of being a parent or having been parented by a parent, we know what to do. We know that most of the templates that we were raised by are extremely obsolete. Many of them are even downright wrong. Our parents did the best they knew how to do, but we know that we cannot 100% base our own parenting off of how we were parented, that's one. So that tells us you need to find this knowledge wherever it resides, with whomever it resides. If you have to pay for a course, please do so. If you have to um, move among certain people, please do so. So that's the first um, That's the first line of action. The second line of action is what Mr. Um, Akin Lamid just spoke about in terms of attitude. So before it was knowledge, knowing what to do, right and then we, we step it down to attitude and skill and all those things but i like that he has i've quickly adjusted my own notes too because <laughs> we are all learning from the faculty so when mr akilami makes an adjustment all of us adjust sharply so i've adjusted my notes and i see the sense in that is that we also need to check our attitude to parenting how seriously do we take it do we think it's a piece of cake like i i had i, I had my daughter and I, I was looking at her when she was when i was like oh my goodness you mean the destiny of this child lies in my hands and i took it very seriously that's not to say you shouldn't have fun or smell the roses and now become like a professor in raising your own child no it is that we first of all have the attitude and the um, awareness of how important this role is 
uh, in life generally. So basically it's number one, find the knowledge. Number two, adjust your attitude very quickly. Understand that a child is born empty. Like they, have, they don't understand bias, they don't understand good or bad. So everything they are doing is a reflection. So uh, Mr. Lapulation will say, oh, there, there's no such thing as stubborn children, it's ignorant parents. So we see that at the end of the day, in my own, in the course of my own work and experience as well, you see that everything doubles down to the parents. I check how my children used to wail at each other. And I'll correct them why you shout. And then I it, it occurred to me that I shout, this is how you speak to them. I had to do that adjustment. So we are constantly learning, it never ends. You finish one phase and you, as you are heaving a sigh of relief like this, the next phase is coming and you need to constantly be learning. You need to constantly, first of all, have that attitude of this is important work. How this child turns out to a very large extent, not 100%, but to a good extent, is based off of what I project, how the things I expose them to, the, 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 uh, so, the socialization they get, the cultural and religious or spiritual values they get, how what we instilled in them. You know, is how in Yoruba they say, oh, fairy, anything you put inside the fairy, what's fairy self? Whistle is what it will blow out. So on its own, the whistle will just be there, inertia. But when you blow air into it, the whistle gives out a sound. That's what I see parenting as. So we need to first of all understand, have the right attitude, see, know that children are, we have this t shirt in the tower, a child is a person. Understand that this child is a person. A child is not your property to own or to do whatever it is you like with. My mom would say, we are caregivers. She used to say this, order, I like that on meal, you know, like this child was given to me by God to take care of when I have to give account, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that, that formed my own basis for my own parenting as well. You know, so we, I, I don't feel like I own my child. I see them as, I see myself as a vehicle through which they came to the world and I will be held accountable. So first of all, we need to adjust our attitudes accordingly, see children properly. You know, so when we're talking about the rights of children, right to life, right to survival, I was reading the that United Nations, UNRCS, R something, something. I know that um, or, um, the barristers in the house would know that. You know, it talks about right to education, right to this and that. And the last one was um, the right to express their opinion. So that tells you that their children, they need to be involved in their own existence, their own protection, their own everything. So how do we see children? What is our own attitude to parenting as parents? What do we see our role as in the life of our children? Two is how do we see children? Do we think that they are, you know, Mr. Kilami will always use this example, like there's everybody in this bus. Well, we know there's a place of our cultural orientation and everything. So there's a feast on the table. The adults will eat the big, big chicken and give children the small, small ones. Oh, in general. <laughs> You know, so that's part of, that. that's a reflection to be honest. It sounds like a, for me, it's a reflection of how you see a child. You know, so there's all these things that we need to adjust in how we see children. We need to adjust our attitude of how we see ourselves as parents and what we think our roles are. Then we need to go and find the knowledge, get the knowledge, pay for it if you have to do your research, you know, ask questions. And this is the beauty of forums like this. Ask questions, what you are con if you are confused about something, ask. Be in the right circles is very critical. So I think that this as, is a symposium conversation, but this is a good summary of how to parent our children right. I can't remember how the question was framed, but you know, proper parenting of children always starts with the parents. It's called parenting for a reason, not, not childing, you know? So it always starts with us as the parents, get the knowledge you need, put yourself in the right circles. There are people that I had to distance myself from when my children were little. You know, she, she brought her niece to my house and I observed that the, the boy took my daughter to behind the curtain. And my daughter came out with this very funny expression and I said, why did you go to behind the curtains? You should play here. I knew that, you know, something had happened. Perhaps he tried to, you know, touch her in an inappropriate that she didn't understand. You can always tell the body language. And this lady said, oh, they are just children now. Why are you being hard? You know, she, she was giving the impression that I was maybe picking on her, her knees or anything. And I already knew that this is not my circle, you know? So those kinds of things, we need to be very aware of them. We need to position ourselves properly as parents, get the knowledge because we have children does not mean we know how to raise them. You know, I, I, I made some payments. I made a lot of sacrifices get the knowledge, the attitude is very important. The knowledge is important. The skill is important. Then how we see children, you know, we need to sit down and say, how, we, how, do, how do I see a child? And the, the, the biases are there. That's how we were raised. We were raised 
and you children get the smallest portion of the meat and say, oh, in fact, some people say children don't eat meat, or you are not entitled to meat. My children will say, mommy, please, I'm a growing child. You shouldn't even be eating the chicken. It's for us. So we are now raising a generation of children that are even more aware. So that's on one level. On the socialization level, again, it's a rat race. You know, the more we think we conquer, the more, you know, it's like onions. You keep peeling it and there's different layers. So you think you have conquered, uh, I don't know, online safety. And then this other one opens up and then this other one opens up. So it's a continuous journey. We need to be in a, in a state of presence of mind. You know, that willingness to continue learning, understanding that it's a journey and it never ends. Even when your children are now grown and married, there's another level where we can't call it parenting at that point, but there's also another duty that you owe to them, you know, because even as newlyweds, there are foolish things you will do that you have wisdom. There's a way also, a manner in which you can then interfere in their lives at that point. So it's a continuous process. We continue to learn. We continue to open our minds up. We see children, how they should be seen as persons with dignity of their own individualness. So I, I think that's that's how we can summarize it so that we don't sleep here. <laughs> Thank you, Ma. Mrs. Ayayeni, <clears throat> that was profound. Um, you see, there are three things I want to bring out from what you said. What, everything you said is profound. Um, we are the part parenting ideology or philosophy or the idea or the teaching. And the number one thing is this, is the fact that you produce after your kind. You are going to produce after your kind. There's no other way. There's another ideology. The way you do one thing is the way you do everything. Behavior your values, they are like smoke. You can't cover it with, with basket. It will come out. You react, Mr. Lakleshoya has taught that you act and respond from your reflex. It's a program. There's habit of doing. Mr. Lakleshoya has distinguished between habit of doing and the habit of thinking. Look at how much you struggle with doing when something is now your habit of thinking. It's the way you think. Are you getting what I'm saying? So the challenge I see a lot of times is that people want to learn skills. That's why I say I've uplifted attitude to number one. Skills does not help anybody. Yoruba um, philosophy has a proverb. If out of anger, you give your car to the insane, the insane is going to mess up the car. Now, this is the issue. The cap is good. The problem is not with the cap. The car does not have an issue. But let a somebody who is drunk, who is intoxicated, get behind it. It will change the destiny of that car. Though the car is perfect, but because the person who is driving it already has problem, it's not in a good shape to drive it, there's a problem. So the first thing we want to pay attention to, my greatest, greatest prayer, and my greatest concern today as I'm raising a child is to say, I don't want this child to inherit my errors. I don't want him to inherit my weaknesses. So what do I need to do? I need to work on them because the little one is watching me. So example is key. So the number one thing when you talk about parenting, it's not even about the children. It's about us. It's about who we are. They are going to take after our uh, the way we do stuff. They are going to take after the way how courageous we are, or how fearful we are. They are going to take after the way we take the decisions. They are just watching. I was telling, I was having a conversation with my wife today, yesterday. I said, there are four things the area your does very well. He enjoys, he enjoys doing many things, but he doesn't joke with four things. I said, number one thing he does not joke with is example. He mimics words. He mimics attitude. He mimics, if, if I put your hand on your head, you see him also putting his hand. 
if you are doing, you are, you are, you are, you are, you know, shuffling, you are trying to dance, you see him also, you know, doing it. And he's been doing that for a while. He follows example. You know, when people are talking to me, I say, mm, mm, mm. That's the first thing he picked. Mm, mm, mm. Anything. You think he wants to make the next statement? Is that only mm? After a while, he will pick his phone. He will take a phone and say, hello? Hey, yo? He has been doing that maybe, maybe, maybe when he was one or immediately after one year old or something. He say, because he sees us carrying the phone. Example. That is children. They follow example. So the question is, before we move to knowledge, skill, some of us, we need treatment. We need help. As a matter of fact, one day we were going for a program and I told Olabisi, 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 we were going for the program together. I said, Olabisi, you know what? I think that there should be a school where people should go to. Government should create this school. I said, this thing I'm saying is not possible, but <laughs> let me just say it. The government should create a school that when you say you are ready to have children, you will go to the school. They will now certify you that you are good to have children. They will certify your emotional stability. They will certify your value. They will certify everything. They will look at you, they say, you don't have from our recommendation. After observing you for some time, we don't, you are going to cause more trouble having than not having. So this couple just go and enjoy yourself. They just give you sterilization that will not make you up. Well, so you cannot have under our watch, you cannot. Not even when I say, sir, please, I'll go and improve my attitude, okay. Let's give you five years sterilization. Now, nothing will happen in that five years. Go and uh, watch your attitude come back, we'll test you again. I said, that's what we should be doing. You, you can have, but only one. You just have one, you know, from, from because for what we can see, <laughs> you can't manage more than one. Are you getting it? So, the truth of the matter is that child bearing is not regulated to the extent that who can have children. You know, it's not regulated. If government regulates child bearing, is to the is to the extent of controlling explosion. That is a, a um, what do you call it? Um, population explosion. I saw a documentary this weekend. I think I saw the documentary yesterday or day before yesterday, of a boy that was that did not know his father, sexually molested, messed up, wandered about until he got to a place where he found somebody who said he has founded a religion because he was charismatic. They handed over leadership to him. This man built a massive kingdom. The, the American state one day wanted to go and arrest him. They met where they did not expect. In a shootout with his group, he said he's the Messiah. He said he's the new Messiah. Funny enough, he was also 33 years old <laughs> when all of that was happening. <laughs> there was a new Messiah now. He held that place down. He killed four police officers, federal officers, on duty. His group, they now injured 12. The government called for ceasefire. They negotiated with him for 51 days before finally you know, government has to gas the place, thinking that they will come out. You know, these people did not come out. Over 80 people died that day, apart from people that were rescued. That is what childhood can do. So who were the people who killed those people that day? Now, you would think it's the man. No, it is the upbringing that messed him up, looking for attention, asking for validation. That validation, he did not get it because he would say, okay, I'll release everybody in three days. Just put me on national TV. They put him on national TV. I want every TV in America to carry me, including TBN. They beg TBN. They put his message there. They played it for him. He said, no, that he wants to write the interpretation of the book of Revelation. That until he finished, he can't release anybody. 51 days. Because the guy, his attention is... Is, is what he was stabbed off as a child. That was what he was looking for as an adult. 
and he convinced those people, adults, he told all of those people that all their wives, that is the Christ, and every woman there is the bride of Christ, collected all their wives. There was the only one that has the right to have the wives. Men were there in that is come who gave their wives to him. Some women who could not stand it, they, they left. But most women stayed. You can see somebody looking for attention. You can see somebody who is sick of uh, 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 acceptance. Because love to children means appreciation and attention. So I want to charge us, in addition to what Mrs. Uh, Ayayani has said, the most important thing is you. Who are you? You are going to produce after your time. You are going to produce your fear. You are going to produce your intimidation. You are going to produce your prejudices. You are going to produce everything. Whatever you don't like in your child today, you are the one who put it there. And when you are tired, you are the one that will remove it there. So we spent one hour, 16 minutes or there, but I'm going to take one more questions from one from Olabisi, one from Isaiah, and then we'll round up. Then we'll let you know how we're going to continue to answer you know, all of these questions. So I go to Olabisi now. Um, Olabisi, your next question, are you there? Um, yes, yeah, your next question says, um, our children will continually be exposed to negative effects of the media today. How do we combat this as parents? Hmm. Okay, let me let me add another question so that you can just take. How do stakeholders ensure that response systems are made accessible to even the common man when cases of abuse arise? You know, that's what we're dealing with this week, when the yes. common man is involved. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, so the first question is that our children will always be exposed to negative media influence. Yes. What um, do we do? What do we do? So, um, you know, I, I recently shot a video, which I have not yet published. And the funny thing is that, you know, society, our, our, our reaction to children when they do things that are wrong is one of judgment and one of um, one of pointing fingers. But I, I, what I always say is that children did not raise themselves. You know, society raised children. All of us, we, we, we parented them to where they are right now, including, you know, adults on social media. You know, social media has things put on there by many adults, many people. Social media is just a, is just a, um, it's just a conduit. It's a, as, as, as it is called, it's a medium, right? That is used by people, both old and young, to pass information across. So, um, this we have to go to the root of the issue how is negative media negative information how is it generated it is generated by people by adults by young people young people who learn from adults adults who learn from some other adults when they were young and the cycle keep, keeps keeps continuing so um two things that we must do first is that every one of us we must be responsible in, to the extent that um, we begin to look at the quality of our values, the quality of things that we consider to be fun, consider to be good enough to post online. Because the truth is that, um, you know, there are age limits on social media. There's um, 12, 13 for Facebook, 16 for WhatsApp, 16 for Instagram, that, you know, parents, we should be aware of definitely so that we can, you know, put the proper control in place. But just as well as that, sometimes children stumble on things. In fact, they will definitely stumble on some things. Some children who do not know about these limits would probably bring some things to school. They sit somewhere and all that. When, we, when people go on social media, what is the quality of that they see? And you see, one of the biggest scams that we have in society right now is that this is not appropriate for persons under the age of 18. And that means that people over the age of 18 can do it, right? So that means that adults can, some things are good for adults. It's good enough for us, of course, because we can't control adults. They're already big, you know, they can make their own choices. But so it's good for adults. Adults put those things, they practice it. But same is not good for children. So until we can uh, really, which is a, a, a tough call, can work on our values as a society by ourselves, everybody work on our values. We, we actually judge what is wrong to be wrong and judge what is right to be right. Then we know we lose our moral right to complain about young people. But as parents, what can we do to ensure that we can control the effect of this thing that we all should be working on, on our children? Number one is that as children grow, 
um, we must gently expose them to things. For example, you know that cartoons have age limits, things have age limits on television. We cannot be lazy as parents. You know, I've always told people that if, if you can have just one child, one child, you just have to check your resources, check your work. You know, it, 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 people say things like, you know, it, it, it can have it all. It can have, I can be a mother, I can be, you know, climb the ladder, I can be a father, you know, and I still have, I still have children. You must define, you must understand what parenting means. And that lets you know the things that you can take on your life and how many children you can take on. How many can you really watch and cater for? Can You can watch what they see on TV. You can teach them what it means to be on social media for those that are of age already. Because they must use technology, they must use phones. We, we, we cannot make our children disadvantaged because we don't want them to get exposed to things. So as we gradually expose them to things age appropriately, it gets to an age where they have learned by values. That, no, 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 we don't say things like this. We don't watch this. It's not for you. It's not meant for you. And that guides them. So that when you're not even there, they know that, oh, would they see pornography? Most likely they will. The first time I saw pornography I was in my church. Very surprisingly, you know, I saw pornography first in church. With they pornography, yes, they definitely will. So the question is that when they see it, what do they do? How do they respond? Or if they see it, when they see it, what do they do? How do they respond? What do they hear me? What do they do? You know, I have a compassion with you. I'll be like, they'll be like, ah, Auntie BC or Miss BC, can I listen to this one? Say some songs are bad. But this one is not so bad. Though. They're not saying anything negative. They are, you know, they begin to have conversations. See, until we can get to children on the level of reasoning and make them become thinkers themselves. Not just telling them what to do and what, what, what not to do. Rules and regulation is that I, as a child, as a young person, I can see a situation and I can judge it. This is not good enough for me. Based on what I've put into them, as we always say, children are person. So we we, 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 we we enhance their sense of self-worth. So this is not aligning with my sense of self-worth. Then that sense of self-worth begins to control their thinking and their sense of judgment. And then influences their choices eventually. So when they come to come across it, something online, they contact something, they know that this content is not for me, you know, and then that begins to affect how what, what choices that they make eventually. So last question as to how to make sure that you know response comes to the common man. Um hmm. it's a very it's a very it's a very sad one because the truth is that um the, for the for the average person in Nigeria, average young average average poor person, average person on the streets, Child protection is still is still a very far fetched idea for them. It's a mirage because um for my for my life experience, I live in a community called the Solo. That's where I grew up, and I look at lives. People people still live in mud houses there, and I look at children. On an average, children like every month a child is getting pregnant. I'm I'm not even exaggerating, because you know adults impregnate these children, and there are no consequences. What happens is that these children get impregnated. They, 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 they sit them off as wives to those to these guys, let them, you know what, put t-shirt, t-shirt, machine here, pack up your things, you are going to you're going to their to their family. Their family will take care of you, they'll give you food. Now their biggest fear is that if this child is left alone, who will feed the child that the child is going to give it to? So a baby is giving birth to a baby, you know, peep, clear cases of molestation. And the community, the culture says, you know what? When they come to beg, you just accept so that your children, your child can have a father. And I, and I ask the question, who is the father really in these circumstances? So they don't, they don't even know who to talk to many times. So what we need to do is, you know, to see an hand to end process. We have different agencies who are doing great work. In fact, you know, things are changing to some extent. I, I, the other day I called DSVRA's contact and, and somebody picked, it was dead in the night. Somebody really, really picked. And I was really, I was happy to see that really. But the truth is that when somebody picks on that call, who in the in every in every community there should be somebody you know like like we have balance there should be a child protection oh, we don't have so many community we, can't, we have CDAs we know them let there be somebody that the I can I know I know them they're my family they're my neighbors I cannot say ah but can you go and go and go go and that man can call the agencies the agencies can call and there is a real solution not just that we say okay we arrest the person how would this family fare what would happen to them so the truth is that the state of the nation um the poverty issues issues of commitment the political will to see that things are done i'm not just talking about people just arguing over things during elections i'm talking about seeing that we elect people that can ensure that things are done for the common man so that when there's a problem of protection there's an issue you know both preventive both responsive there is an end you know a, a system that works from the from that person on the street, from that common man to the government, they can talk to somebody. That person calls the next person. That person calls, them, and there's response at all levels. And the issue of attitude is a very deep one because when you go and put the matter to the police, and police says, "Ah, kid, one or one as a child, you not And there's nobody actually, you know, nobody standing for what is right. Police is, you know, they, they, they hear issues, 
and they, they culture, they make it a cultural issue, and they close, they, they ask somebody to come and settle as if they are they are a settlement party or the immigration center, and they say, you know what, settle after they settle, everything ends there. Where's the attitude to see what is right? And people we do trainings every time. People they train police, they train judges, they train people, they train everybody. Honestly, people, we need to begin to implement what we have been trained on, what we have heard, we begin to, begin to use it so that when the common man goes to the police station and says this happened to me, he can find help. When he goes to talk to somebody in the community, he can find help. So really it's holistic and it happens by creating systems. Even in the community, there can be a community child protection um, system. We, are, we think we did one for SOS children village one time in, in, in a community, which will be implemented. Everybody knows about it. In the way we put road stickers around, put it there. So your child is molested, you know, put it in different languages, call this number. Let people, let's, let's do this, really, really do this work so that everybody can actually feel the impact. Thank you very much. You are muted, sir. Mr. Kilami, you are muted. Thank you very much, Ms. Olabisi, for your insight. Now, this, this, let me just say something that I said to Olabisi this week. We had intervened in the life in the issue of a woman whose daughter was statutorily, statutorily raped. And now she's pregnant. And um, the woman is out there. And there's pressure on the woman. The matter has escalated to the police. And there's pressure on the woman to give up. You know, and um, what ABC told me, I said, yeah, she's going to give up. Because the system has designed her to give up. Ideally, what should happen is that that woman should be relocated out of that place to another place with her daughter. But the question is that the resources to do it, is it available at the level of the state? Is the state going to make that money available? You know, so poverty is a major issue. When a person, the reason why someone will not even complain that the children have been abused is because they look at it. When I complain now, what's next? Are they going to, if they even say they want to fight for me, what's next? So the child who, who's the mother, who the mother cried out that they sent away from school because she used the exercise to, to use the poster of a particular political party to write her exercise book. Do you know that that child now has been reinstated, but thugs, we're going to harass the parents for reporting the matter, you see? And they were warning the parents, the parents must make sure nothing happens to that principal who allegedly sent the child away. Now, we're not only you calling the device people, we spoke to the father, we have his phone number, we called him, we spoke to him, he told us this thing by himself, not that we read it in the newspaper. I'm telling you first-hand report, we have to escalate again to tap protection network and it's okay, they are doing their bits about that. So poverty is a major issue, it needs to be addressed. That cannot be emphasized. Um, then on the other issue of, um, what's the other issue that uh, Labisi just addressed? On the issue of, um, um, okay, sorry. Social media and um, negative media and children. Negative media and children. Um, where our children watch what we watch. That's, that's why I'm going to hang it. They watch it, even if they don't watch it with you, they watch it in you. There's a man that I listen to, his name is Henry McManus. He said, what, what informs you, forms you. What informs you, forms you. So whatever you are looking at, you may say, I've taken the chair, they have gone to sleep. It's only me that is watching it. The, those things that you are watching are forming you and your children are going to follow you. And so that's what happens. So before I ask Ms. Um, Ayoyani to take the last question, I, I just saw a question here that is, um, that is very, very germane. And I think I want to quickly look at it. <clears throat> Somebody saying that parenting in the developed, parenting in Nigeria 
and in developed country nations is quite different. How do parents who relocate navigate the change in the best interest of their precious children? You know, this is very, very important. Parents in search for greener pasture leave the shores of Nigeria. As a matter of fact, many parents will tell you that the reason why they leave is to leave, they leave because of their parents. They're looking, they, sorry, they leave because of their children because they are looking for better opportunities for their children. Now, so you get to another country. One, you are the new, new American or the new Briton or the new Canadian. You are there. Then your children are going to mingle faster with the culture of the land than you. When they begin to mingle with the culture of the land, what happens? What culture are they raised with that is able to stand at par, withstand, koto, or disagree with the culture they are going to meet? That is a big issue. As a matter of fact, it's been occurring to me that one day we are going to do a session on the, the issues, I don't want to call it crisis, that parents who relocate face with their children. Because you see, if you move to a first world country, you move to a world where children matters. It's not that they matter on paper, the way it is in a third world country, is that they matter in fact, is that the society knows that their future is their children. That's why they give them free education until they get to college. That's why they, in New York, anybody below 18 will enter free bus, it's free. I'm talking about public bus, it's free, just ride. These are people who understand that children are the pivotal link between the future, between the present and the future. When you come here, you find out that the children are taught to be free. Any first world country, they are taught to be free. If you go to Scandinavian countries, it's even worse. It was in the sense that <laughs> children are kings. And they know, they will tell them in school, they will let them know. So it is not um, uncommon for parents to find that their children have reported them to authorities. So what do you need to do? The first thing you need to do is to accustom yourself with the reality that is on the ground, that there is no hiding place here. What this society is going to defend children. There's a case I'm dealing with now, a case I'm following now, four children, a couple, went somewhere they were with four children. I think they let them in the car to go and get something. Authorities came there. They have seized the four children now. In the last one month, they are still on it. That you are not fit to have children or to be in charge of children. They took the custody of those children. So the first thing we need to do is to accustom ourselves to the reality of the land we have moved to. What is their disposition towards children here? After we have understood that, we don't need to sit if we don't need to also note that our children are being socialized and in a, in a first world country, freedom is the thinking. Most of the time, liberalism is the thinking that you can mess up. Society will clear your mess. You can mess up, who will clear your mess? So there's, there's this thinking of liberty that I can do anything I like. Society will pay for it. Unfortunately, it does not work that way. When you live your life the way you are not supposed to live it, society does not show up to say, we are, going to, we are going to take the bullet for you. You take the bullet for yourself. So what the society is telling young people is completely false that you go there, we are with you. Speak your truth, do your thing. Is your thing, is your life. And we are here to support you. We are here to give you back up. When the child gets on drug, begins to mess up, does things that a child is not supposed to do, 
because he knows that he or she knows that there's a backup. Somebody is going to speak for me. Then we begin to run around and say, what do we do? Why can we solve this problem? So for me, you have to learn the culture. Understand the culture. Number two, what values do you want to, have you inculcated in your children? And what values do you want to remind them of so that when they come in contact with that culture, perhaps the culture is not going to deliver to them what to believe will make a difference in the lives of your children. They're able to confront the culture. That without, without throwing you under the bus, they're able to hold their own before the culture, depending on who they are and all of that. So it is important that we understand that when you bring children to the diaspora, environment is important. Understand the environment. What culture have you inculcated in your children? That's what I'm going to say to that. So, Ms. Ayani, let me ask you, uh, last question we'd like to ask you, and we'll be out of here. The question says that, the question says that, at what age, yes, yes, at what age, do parents get there begin to discuss sexual, sexual education with their children? I'll add, it, I'll add another one so that you can take them together. What is the best method of discipline to adopt while raising children? <laughs> okay, so in terms of the sex and sexuality, what we have come to understand is that as early as, you know, we used to say 18 months, 18 months, but for me, it's as early as the child starts to socialize. So we know that from birth, maybe it's just mommy holding baby or daddy, or I mean, the network is small. But for me, as soon as the network starts to expand considerably, I believe that children should start being, you know, they are more aware of themselves, they run around, they do X, Y, Z, especially from when, we, we, we heard about Thierry now that now says hello on the phone. He can look at you. If you are rolling your hands, he's rolling his. It has started. Life has started, you know, for these kids. So it's important that from that age, from that point, where they can express themselves, where they are, they, their exposure to other humans have increased, we start to teach them propriety. So we start from things like boundaries, things like um, what are your body parts, what are they for? What are your own personal rights? Of course, in, in age-appropriate terms, and this is where the, the this is the catch to it. This is part of why we need to learn of children. Is the reason why we need to get education. So how do we start to have these conversations? And it's very sad. One day I attended my children's school. There's this compulsory um, parenting course you are required to take as a parent, as a new parent, in taking to the school. And I was very shocked to realize that. All the parents there said they would rather have the, the school talk to their children about sex and sexuality. They have no intention of, of going over the subject with them. It's too uncomfortable. It's too somehow. That's true. Perhaps none of us had that template. I know I didn't have any of those conversations. You know, nobody told me about it. I figured it out on the go. You know, but we obviously cannot leave those things to chance. So for me, from 18 months, from when the, the child's, you are sending the child to daycare already, the child is moving around, the child is, you know, those kinds of things. It's important that they understand age appropriate sex and sexuality education. Sexuality in terms of what are your body, body parts? What is it even used for? Right? What is, um, what is the function of your eyes, your nose? Is it composite, you know, space? And this also is a reflection of how we treat them as well. So it's so huge in terms of when they go to the doctor. So they, they need to start understanding their, their, their own dignity of human person. That's why I said, how do we see the child? So from when my children were small, a doctor cannot just say, lie down there, remove your clothes. It's not possible. <laughs> my children will say, why? <laughs> you have to say, why? The doctors always look so embarrassed because maybe they are, they are not used to children asking why. So the doctor, oh, I'm sorry, but, the, but we can see now that in, well, maybe not everywhere. Some doctors are now, oh, so I want you to, to lay, so right now I just want to hear your chest, you know, so I may have to pull your dress down a little bit. It starts from there. 
It starts from there. So first of all, learning, helping them to learn of themselves, understand themselves, understand what is my body parts used for at the at that basic level. At that basic level, we must understand what is your vagina used for, what is your this one used for, what is your breast for. So those kinds of things are they are my body parts. I we through here, I put through here. So before we even start complicating things for the children, those basic information is very critical. Then as they go on. As they go on, we start to expand the conversation age appropriately. And the problem with age appropriateness now is that the age has doubled down. So the conversations that were appropriate to have with a 10 year old, maybe five years ago, is late to have it at 10 now. So you will now have to also follow the trends, what's going on. We also need to understand that, and this is an advice that ED gave me. And this is why I said, those kinds of conversation, you need a village, a support system. I cannot tell you the amount of time that I even have gotten confused. And I have to run, ED, what should I tell her? Ah, this is what I tell her, she said, ah, this is the response she gave me. You know, we pay, this child has gone for, I said, okay, 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 use this analogy. You know, because I, I had that team of people. And then again, um, you know, just to do things with, um, to, to give caution, you know, don't be paranoid. So the goal is not, you pick up your child from school. Did anybody touch you today? So we also need to get creative. How do we address these issues? How do we talk to them about it? Is it age appropriate? So you're, you, have, you may have three children. The conversation you are having with one is age appropriate at 10. The conversation we are having with another, that conversation you are having with one at 10 is seven for the other one. So these are part of the intricacies of parenting. You know, it is to understand what is age appropriate, what they are exposed to. And if you see any issues, don't wait. Address it immediately. At least, maybe not immediately. Maybe if you are a bit flustered or, I mean, there are, there are many things guiding these conversations. I don't know, I'm, I'm having trouble summarizing. But, you know, you cannot go and say, ah, you know, the child will just hold back. So it is also because it's also like a, a respond thing, a response thing as well. So you see that, oh, this child was unwittingly exposed to this thing and she looks confused or he looks confused. You address that one, even if, it, even if the child is five. A child that is five years old that was exposed to pornography, you have to address that thing at that age. You cannot say I'm waiting for them to be eight to, because that's the age appropriateness. So it is very dynamic these days. We have to be very observant. We have to be watchful. We have to ask the right question, respond in the right ways, have an open door policy. You know, don't make a big deal out of issues. My own children too, they, they're falling off the bandwagon. I mean, I, I run to Mr. Kill. I'm, hey, help me. I'm there to say, calm down. What was the big deal? You know, children. Will, so we have to have all these templates in place. But unfortunately, there is no template because your templates will fail. I assure you, at some point in time, things will go faster or slower than you anticipated. And then you need to make those adjustments. So helping them to understand their own rights as human beings, their body parts, what is used for, and as they go on in life, how to... I don't know how to, what the application of that is for them. They have the value system, very critical, very, very critical. So you see some children now, they are labeled. They are, ah, what do they encourage you? You know, you can't say, but <laughs> that's their own. You can't touch them. You can't give them. Well, that, that's how they feel. That's how they we must respect. So that courage to be able to stand up for themselves, to say, well, this is who I am. I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with your hug. I know many adults that will say, I'm not a hugger. I've seen them, I have friends. I'll say, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't know. I, I flinch a bit, but I'm just not a hugger. I just don't, I just like that space, you know? So those kinds of things, we must help them to be comfortable in their own skin. And we must also, because they are children, there will be some things they do. Like my baby now, she, she's very gummy. Anybody she sees, she wants to be carried. She wants to sit on whose laps. I'll say, no. You have legs for a reason. You know, we make a joke of it that uh, you've passed the stage. That's why you have legs. You know, when you were running around and we're holding you, now is the time. You know, so we turn it into a joke. We make Kai a bit more comfortable. And I'm not afraid to tell anybody in the presence of my, my husband's friends will come, see people, put them on the, because she's very attached to them, sit them on their, they will sit down on their lap, want to feed her because she likes being babyish. In their presence, I'll say, no, you take your food. You sit on your own chair and you eat your own food. So there's all kinds of um, plugins to these things, but the goal is help children to be comfortable in doing it, help them to understand what is right, what is appropriate. Sorry, it may not be right or wrong, but what is appropriate per time. And then we also should, you know, just keep what, keep our eyes open, keep our minds open, keep our ears open to hear the things that are not even being spoken. And also to keep up with the times. You know, there was a time when, 
you know, social media, it just blew up suddenly. I know even children in the US were traumatized about this mass uh, suicide. There was this guy that went on one popular social media and were, was recruiting young children to be committing suicide. It was such a mess, you know. Many children were very, very upset and traumatized. Many of them watched people commit suicide online, live on, on the internet, you know. So parents that were smart had to quickly, you know, step in. Of course, maybe the issue of suicide was not appropriate at that time, but they had to now have that conversation about, okay, this is what, this is the effect of this, this is the effect of that. You know, we are sorry for those of them that needed to talk, that needed to vent, that needed to have, that had questions. People quickly stepped in because it has happened and we need to, we can't wait and say, okay, you know what, suicide is not for now, suicide is for later. So that's um, how I would summarize that. As Mr. Kilami said, all these questions are symposium conversations. And for discipline, the issue of discipline in the faculty, <laughs> in, uh, in Taiwan Kilami Academy, we have very extremely unpopular, unpopular positions that even challenge us who are members of the faculty. So we need to understand what the purpose of discipline is. Discipline and punishment is not the same thing. Discipline is guidance. So we need to first of all look at what is the purpose of this? There are things that are, I, even you see happen. So just because you know this is, does not mean that you automatic, because don't forget there's socialization, there's, there's the impact of culture and socialization and how we were raised. So it becomes a bit hard. You have to hold yourself. So having the knowledge is not enough, is that you, you stretch yourself, you hold yourself accountable. If you have a spouse, friends, whatever, you hold each other accountable. And this is why I said is a whole committee of, humans do, doing this thing. So understand what discipline really means as a parent. So if my goal is not to really beat my child per se, my goal is not to make them feel pain or make them cry. My goal is I have seen this behavior that needs to be addressed. I don't, I think that this behavior will not end well for them. My goal is that I want a redirection. So when we start our discipline from the point of the goal we are trying to achieve, then it makes a whole lot of difference. It doesn't mean we are perfect, that we won't shout or we won't spam. But you do it and be like, you call yourself to order. You apologize. I know that's another part that is hard. So when we follow up this discipline bandwagon, it's very critical that we understand. And I know, I know, I know many people, you know, say, ah, Tai Wakila, you Tai Wakila, my friends, you Tai Wakila, me people, you know, <laughs> we've been labeled, but it's true. Just because it's hard does not mean that it is not true. Just because it's difficult does not mean it's not doable. Just because we say it does not mean that we are perfect. As I say, I give myself as an example. Even this morning, self, you know, I'd already carried kid. Ah, let me just. This one is a conversational thing. Ah, they said we should not be. So we, but it is because I'm, I'm, I live in that consciousness, that awareness. So it doesn't mean that the setting that I had as a child will suddenly vanish. It's that it would come up every once in a while, but because I have gone through the process of understanding these things. So I gain nothing from my child crying. My real goal is that I want to redirect this behavior. So you have this genius, you are, you are applying it wrongly. I, this is the way that it needs to be done. And just because you tell the child something once does not mean they will do it. It's the reason why they rec we recited multiplication table for, for maybe a year or two in school, every single day we recite before we learn it. It's the same thing. It's the same thing that just because Mr. Kilami will now come up and say, we don't spank, we think this is, it doesn't achieve the goal. We've, you know, um, we've done, re research has been done, X, Y, Z. But it doesn't mean that we'll just wake up and be cured from our spanking spirit. But it is that we now, hope, we are now aware. We now hold ourselves accountable. We now, get comfortable with doing the uncomfortable things like apologizing, like redirecting ourselves, even as adults, sometimes you redirect, you redirect yourself, say, okay, I shouldn't have shouted at you, sorry, you know, so we start from those kinds of things, and this is the aim of discipline, and um, I don't know if it's Mr. King like me and or, or um, PK, Mr. Shuri, because now, now they are one and the same to me <laughs> these days, is that they, they said something about, um, I lost my train of thought there, but in terms of discipline, basically, it's not that we want to, it's not, discipline is not beating, this does punishment, so the goal is that we just want to redirect, understand what this thing really is, then have a plan, so if you know you are likely to fall into this category, and what works for your children, I was having a conversation with my friend um, over brunch, was it the other, the other day, and she was saying, I observed that the more I beat this child, the harder this child is, I said, yes, I've experienced it too before, they told me I didn't believe. <laughs> so th there are some children that they will just withdraw. I was that child. So if you just raise your voice, like even up till now, 
I can, if I'm having a conversation with my husband and, he, and he's from Undo, Mr. Akilami knows what I'm saying. The moment you raise your hand, I've logged out. I would, I would be calm. I'm not upset. I'm, but you're not communicating to me anymore. Nothing you say makes any sense, even at this age. So we can imagine children. We need to be observant of the kind of children that we have. Some of them we need for us to stand firm in. And this is also the diversity of the children we have as well. Some of them we need strong boundaries, like they will not back down. So the goal is not to create a power tussle with them to say, hey, I will show you is but yeah, it will be a way I will it will not work. They will, they will, they will succumb, but that doesn't mean that, or rather they will conform, but that doesn't mean that they succumbed. And that's not the goal we want to achieve. We really want that transformation in our children. So we understand some of them holding that boundary firmly doesn't really work. It is that conversation. They just need to understand why do I not have to do these things? We also need to be able to encourage our children to ask why, to say no. So you can say, go and take your bath. No. Of course, it's terrible as a parent to, to be on the receiving end of that, but we are preparing them from, for the world. So all of these things we are saying about our children standing up to values, it, it, it's also a function of how they are at home. So if for every time you 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 make them, you you beat them to conform it, not beat it, may not be physical beating, maybe, you know, but just don't engage in that part also. It doesn't really help because they will now become, you know, very timid. They go outside. I mean, the, the impacts are great. It's not something that I'm I'm struggling. I, I must have failed somewhere in school because I find that I find this I'm struggling to really summarize because as I'm speaking, all the other angles of it are just popping in my head. But basically, yes. basically yes. is that we understand what discipline is, we understand the goal we are trying to really achieve. That you beat your child and you feel comfortable and you are and you are relaxed. Being, hey, no, you know, I've I, I've beat the child. Understand that you may not have solved, you are very likely not have solved the problem self if one really want to look at it. So that's how I would summarize it. I, I hope it's good. Um, we spent, if we spend 10 more minutes, <clears throat> we'll have spent two hours. Uh, it's, we've said a lot. And I want to round up. Um, I'm looking forward to how we're going to answer all of these questions because there's a lot of there are a lot of questions here that will have loved us to look at, but if we continue like this, we'll be here till tomorrow. Because, you know, questions that people are asking are matters of life. When it comes to matters of life, it's not two plus two. It's not three plus three. It's not something we can just go straight to the point. You give illustration. You try to, you know, um, get, um, get um, you know, a whole lot of sides. To the conversation. So um, I want to say some things uh, in rounding up. We are surely going to come back to have this conversation again. This cannot be the end. There's a lot that we have not covered. So we are going to figure out how we are going to get that done. And we are surely going to come back to, we are surely going to come back to you, our viewers. But let me say two things. Number one, on the issue of discipline, I don't discuss child discipline again. I discuss the culture of discipline. Discipline is a culture. It's not only the child that needs discipline in the home. Father needs discipline. Mother needs discipline. People who come to visit us, they need discipline. Why you say, we don't, please drop your shoes here. That's discipline. Huh? <laughs> don't bring the shoes into the sitting room. Those are, those are regulations within the home. So discipline is not something that only the child does. And that's where the problem starts. When the child thinks that it is only me that is being disciplined on daily basis, daddy is being disciplined, life is disciplining him. If nobody can talk to him. Mommy is being disciplined, life is disciplining her. If nobody can talk to her. Everybody is being disciplined one way or the other. And so the conversation about discipline is about communicating the culture of discipline. A nation that does not have probity, honor, no integrity. You want to tell children to do otherwise, it's not going to work. A nation where people don't take turns. A nation where people don't um, have respect for dignity of human person. The other day, there's a woman who the son said, mommy must be coming down. 
I went to a platform, a parent, a platform of parents and teachers, which cut across Nigeria and Africa. I wrote my opinion to say this woman publicizing the child was wrong. This child, when the child is old, is she going to like all that has happened? Undue exposure for the child. Because this was a private relationship between you and your child. When you are trying to claim the child, the child say, mommy, you need to be coming down. And the child was crying. The child was traumatized. The child was not joking. The child was not laughing. So you videoed the trauma and you, you gave it to the world. And so everybody came for my head. I mean, come and see the kind of things that people were saying to me in that place. When somebody said, I know this man does not have a child. If he has a child, he can't be thinking this way. They abused me to the point that, now they were not having conversation now. You can disagree with me, but you can disagree without becoming disagreeable. Please note that platform is not the platform of, is not the platform of roadside mechanics. It's not the platform of motor packed out. It is the platform of parents and educationists. They abused me to the point that the, one of the administrators called me and said, Mr. Akina, are you reading the comments? I said, I'm reading them. He said, please, can I turn off the comment? I said, ma, don't turn it off, let it go. When they continue, she called me again. She said, Mr. Akina, I don't think I should put you through this. I understand what you are saying. It is so sad that these are parents, a platform for parents, parents and teachers, educators. These are they are talking. And I'm not, I don't have a problem with you opposing what I'm saying. It's about, and this is about disagree without becoming disagreeable. And these are people teaching children. These are parents who want their children to be courteous. They are children, they'll be saying, hey, what are your magic words? Thank you. Does, is that how life ends? Your children are going to watch you doing all of these things that you told them not to do. That is discipline. What is lacking in the world today is that we have taken this subject matter of child discipline too far. What we should focus on is the culture of discipline. When we focus on the culture of discipline and we let the child understand that everybody there is no human being that is above discipline. Even when nobody can talk to you, life is big enough to fight its own battle. It will deal with you. It's a matter of time. Those little, little things that you have been warned about, that your conscience has warned you about, that you refuse, is going to come like, I was having a conversation with Mr. Lakule this morning, he said, a man's, a man's life is a reflection of the totality of his or her values. He said, any way, any how you see a man's life turned out, that is the summation of the man's value system. And it cannot be, it can, that cannot be overemphasized. That's so true. So eh, you, you don't want children to do stuff. You tell children to be bold. Are you bold? You tell children to be, to be forthright. Are you forthright? You that are uh, saying people should not steal. Do you rob the temple? That's what the Bible says. So if you, so, so please, my disposition to discipline today is that our children are either beneficiaries or victims of our examples. Whatever we don't like today, we are the one who put it there. So be, anytime, anything your child is doing, you are the one who put it there or the people you gave your child to, to help you look after. So when a child has a bit something, the first thing you want to do is not to consult the child, to consult yourself. What have I done? And I will end up with this story. Mahatma Gandhi, this story is online. He sent his son to his mechanic to go and fix his car many years ago. What existed that time was the land phone. And Gandhi expected his son to come back. The son did not show up. So what did Gandhi do? Gandhi called the mechanic. I said, mechanic, where is my son? The mechanic told Gandhi, I've released your son since I've finished the car since it was a minor error. I finished. Then Gandhi waited for his son. The son did not show up. So Gandhi took a walk. And Gandhi met his son. You know, coming with the car. 
then ask the son, son, where have you been? Said, I'm, he said, I was coming from the mechanic. Gandhi said, but I've called the mechanic. The mechanic said, you have, he has released you since. The boy said, oh, I'm sorry, daddy, that um, he went somewhere else. So all this conversation that Gandhi was having with his son, he was having it standing outside the car. So the son said, daddy, come in, let me drop you, let's go home. Gandhi said, no, son, drive home. The son said, why, daddy? He said, I want to be taking a walk. I'm be asking myself how I raised a son that can lie to me. You are not the problem. Son, you don't have any problem. I'm not going to do anything to you. You don't have a problem. This is my problem. How I have raised you as a father that you can look at me in the eye and lie to me. It's my problem. It's not your problem. <laughs> but how many of us think like that? He first slapped the child. He said, you lie to me. Me, your father. You are lying to me. You are cursed. But Gandhi knew better that for the child to lie to the father, something is amiss. This same thing that the child cannot tell you, he will, he will tell friends in school. It's the reason why he's fighting his friends in school because they don't want to, they don't want inner gist. He's going to tell the friend freely that yesterday I took my cast down to the mechanic. I just went somewhere. It's going to tell somebody. Children cannot tell you their mind because they are afraid of consequences. Because, you know, many years ago, Mr. Laclosian would say that you should raise your child in a way that if anything happens, you are the first person your child is going to call. He's going to say, Daddy. He said, God forbid, if your child kills somebody. He's going to say, Daddy, I just killed somebody. And what you are going to say is not going to say, see your life. I told you is to say, where are you? Is to say, what are we going to do now? I'm coming. I'm coming to meet you. Now, that does not mean you are not going to circumvent the course of justice. But your child is going to know that you are with him or you are with her. Even if she's, he or she is going to go through the consequences of that action, you will still feel the love of a father, the love of a mother. That's what we are talking about. Until we adjust ourselves, we can't tell children to adjust themselves. Look at what you are dealing with. Look at the issues we are dealing with as human beings. It's children we don't want to be directed. So are you saying we should leave our children alone? Yes. Are you saying we should not discipline them? No. Leave them alone means that leave them to follow you. Leave them to follow you. Abraham Lincoln says, the Bible says, train up a child the way he should go. When he's older, he will not, he will not depart from it. Abraham Lincoln says, how do you train up a child the way he should go? He said, you will go there first and come back and take the child with you so that you can work together, which means you cannot take your child to where you have not been. It's difficult. It's tough almost impossible. So that's it for us today. I'm going to take final comment from Miss Ayayeni, Mrs. Ayayeni. I'm going to take a final comment from Miss Olabisi. That's Miss. Capital <laughs> MS, Miss. is Mrs. Ayayeni. And um, I'm going to say this about sexuality education, Mrs. Ayayeni. The reason, one of the reasons which we have found why people are saying they don't want to discuss that topic is that they themselves, they had nasty experiences growing up. They've not been healed. So having that conversation reminds them of their experiences, of their pain. And as we have now learned, pain does not have exhaust. It doesn't evaporate, it has to be healed. It has to be dealt with. Any pain that is not dealt with remains with. Time does not heal any wound. Time and medication, time and, 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 and therapy, time and, 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 and treatment is what heal any wound. If you have any wound in your leg now, you know, just leave it and say time will heal it. It will fester. Tetanus will get into it. It will become a gangrene and then problem will start from there. Time does not heal any wound. So parents are dealing with their issues. See, the problem a lot of times is that who is teaching this sexuality education? I know a lot of things that people teach as sexuality education. Their own error combined with their own fear, with their own prejudices, with their own problem. They can't deal with it. They even avoid it. When the child comes to them, go and meet your mother. When the mother comes, when he goes to meet the mother, go and meet your father. Just be tossing the child around as, as, a foot, as, as a football. And the child is confused in the process. So that's one of the reasons. So it's important that who are we that want to teach sexuality education? If you don't take anything, if you want to take anything away from today, it's about that securing a friendly and protective environment for our children rises and falls on who we are. Who we are. 
Mr. Ayayeni was able to pull her children out of the school runs because the school runs was not delivering according to her value because of who she is. She may not know what to do in a situation. She know what she must not do. The situation we dealt with last week, we were able to deal with that way because of who we are. When status quo say, say, says go to bed, we were able to refuse to go to bed because we knew what was necessary was for that person to get help. So ultimately, whether you're talking about school, sexuality, education, school runs, all of these things, it rises and falls on attitude. It rises and falls on attitude. When we do child protection training, we spend the whole day discussing culture. That's attitude. Discussing culture. A whole day. Before we go into technicalities the second day. Because it rises and falls on what you believe. We say in our, in our academy, and our faculty, a child is a person. Do you know that's a teacher? That's a teaching for a whole day. A child is a person. Now, for you to even accept that a child is a, you know, we don't yet accept, accept a child as a person. Now, this is an error. The English law calls a child minor. It's a problem. A child is not a minor. Those laws were made by kings. You know, I've argued this in one of our, in one of our products. They were made by people who's, even those kings, they, step, they saw women, women as inferior. They saw men, as, they saw men that is not at their level, making influential at a level as inferior. They saw color as inferior, not to talk of children. They were the ones who said children are minors. And today we still use that word. A child is a minor, is a minor. How is he a minor? A child is a person, it's not a minor. So how do we correct that deep-seated, as even ingrained in our lexicography? A normal lawyer now will say, a child is a minor, is a minor. We are dealing with a minor. I don't use that word deliberately. A child is not a minor. That the law says is a minor does not mean it's a person below 18 years old. In some countries, below 21 years, old, under 21 years old. It's not a minor. And when you call him a minor, you treat him as a minor. So let me take a parting shot from Ms. Olabi Seafolabi. Um, thank you very much, sir. It was been a very, very, very wonderful eye-opening conversation. And um, I think that personally, the commitment for which we do this work is that um, as a person that is not too, you know, very, very far from um, childhood, you know, at least the, the closest person to childhood, you know, on this call, <laughs> most privilegedly, <laughs> Uh, I recognize the immediate impact of childhood on my life as, a, as an adult, you know, uh, as some, some just basic character traits I, 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 I exhibit right now that I know that I got from my dad and not because he said any word. In fact, he never taught me on those things. He never, ever spoke a word, but I just know that this is something I got from my dad. It's just something that I, I, I experienced by just watching, mirroring and learning as a program, you know. So um, these conversations, especially for people who are, who are their parents are very important because the truth is that, you know, the adults that our children become, you know, they, be, they begin from when they're children. So uh, it's just very critical. And secondly, child protection is possible, is doable. Um, as parents, it's hard, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's very, very doable. Um, rights, understanding all these things are not technical, they're not too much for us. I believe that with the right attitude, with the right skill and knowledge, we can do it. In fact, one of the you on this call, you are already one of those parents that are taking the right step in the right direction. I mean, parents are doing that already. I celebrate parents, not as an adult. I, I, I understand the work that it took our parents, even with the limited knowledge that they have. And thank God that we're making progress, at least for those that are on this call, you know, to get more knowledge. And um, I trust that as we begin to, as we continue on this path, and we do actually things that we're learning that, you know, we'll have children who will be who will grow to be balanced, you know, empathetic, and not just good children, but children that can make a difference in their world. Thank you very much, sir. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you, Mrs. Ayayani. You have the floor. It's 10 p.m. Wow, time really time. <laughs> Time, time runs when we have this conversation because they cannot be exhaustive. But, you know, closing remarks, I want to just appreciate, you know, parents. Parenting is tough. Nobody ever said it was easy. And um, 
I want to appreciate parents that are going out of their way, you know, trying to make a change, doing the difficult things, and parents also that are not aware. You know, it's really tough to be a parent in this in this generation. But what is tougher is being a child. You must understand the burden that children bear in this age of information overload. There is all kinds of things. They, I mean, it's it's it's, it's a lot for children for any child to be alive. It's the best and worst time to be a child. You know, in this generation. It's also the best and worst time to be a parent in many ways, but I feel like the children bear a lot of the brunt. And as Mr. Kilami said, there's so many of us that are coming from very faulty programming, you know, so I think that we need to look inward. A physician heal thyself, right? So all the things that we are demanding from our children, let us look inward, let us make a change, let us alter our, our behavior, our attitude, our personality, our knowledge, whatever it is we need to do to make things better for us and for our children, please let's do it, you know, and um, God help us all. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for yes. your class. I feel like thank you, Ma, for joining us again, Ola BC. I'm grateful. Thank you so much for sparing time, uh, taking time out of your extremely busy schedule to join us today. Uh, I want to thank um, Mrs. Ayayani for your contribution. I mean, um, taking time for joining us, your time, your contribution. The same thing on ABC for your contribution, insightful, you know, very, Thank very, very much, lucid and um, clear headed. Thank you so much for joining us. Please, we want to beseech you by the message of God, like this video, like it, share it. Uh, also, uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, put on the notification bell so that when we have Another broadcast, you'll be the first to know. Thank you for joining us. Follow us Follow us on Instagram. Our Instagram account is going to be under this, uh, this our Instagram account. Everywhere you can reach us, including phone number and all of that, you know, we're available. Um, something I didn't say, which I forgot to say, Mrs. Ayayani, if uh, people here want to reach, how do you advise that they reach you? Oh, well, I'm, I'm on Instagram. I think that most of my details are there at IOINE1 underscore. I keep forgetting. <laughs> it's um, at IOINE underscore. Okay, yes, that's it. IOINE underscore on Instagram. I'm available okay. there. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm just a DMA. Okay. Miss Olabi Safalabi. Same for me. I'm on Instagram at Olabi Safalabi on LinkedIn. Olabi Safalabi. And of course, the DM works as well. Well, I'm okay. happy on other platforms. Yes, Thank these you. are resource persons, ladies and gentlemen. And um, these are astute, um, um, committed resource persons. I'm in this space and um, I hear what people say. I've trained at many levels. Uh, I see crisis people get into and I, and I know that only few people understand the issues. Look at something that just happened now. This child who was asked to go home, allegedly because he wrapped his paper with uh, his notebook with um, political, uh, a political poster. Everybody went to town. The major media, they went to town with the name of this child. Bloggers went to town with the name of this child. NGO people went to town with the name of this child. And it is wrong. You are not supposed to declare the identity of that child. That's what we spoke about yesterday. How many people know that? But people in our faculty know that. We also have the name. As a matter of fact, we got to know about this incident from the broadcast of the mom. True, the mom used the name, the name of our family. But we know better that we should not use the name. The mom also cannot be blamed. The mom is, 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 dealing with, is asking for help. She believes that she needs to mention the name of her child so that people can come to her rescue. Right, she didn't know better. Are you getting it? And she was, she and you can't blame her, you can't hold her, you can't do it. You see, but we that we now are experts, should we do that? I see NGO people, I see platforms that are supposed to be child protection people, I see media, the major medias of this world mentioning the name of this child, exposing her unduly. And we address that we issue a president, we never mention the name of this child. And what happened was that thugs were going to harass that family because they were duly exposed. The people exposing them is not going to give them money to go and rent another place. So, but that is the resource that our people have here. What I'm saying is that if, you, if a Mrs. Ayayani knows that, understands that, Olabi Sovabil knows that and understands that, that's just an index. 
of what they can do to your program if you invite them to be part of it. So please uh, invite them, call them, let them speak to you, let them speak to your children, let them speak to your Mrs. Ayayani had a training, uh, a, a, a presentation on bullying. Honestly, it was mind blowing. I was listening to her, I was looking at her, that is this, this Mrs. Ayayani, is it the one talking? I mean, it was all awesome. In our last conference, you know, she did a presentation on bullying, very powerful. Are you getting it? Other BC has unusual insight to please use these resources. I, are we together? Thank you very much. Yes, I must thank Sefiat Jibrin Amza. Sefiat is, <laughs> is larger than life, is a woman of many parts, is the team, is the head of the team behind the scene, making sure that everything works as Absolutely. we want it to be. Yes. She's multifaceted, she's everything. I mean, um, she gives everything, like Olabisi. <laughs> Except their lives. Except their lives. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, um, um, Sefiat. Sefiat Susu, I learned another of her name from Mrs. Ayayeni. Say Susu, I say, ah, she's Susu. Say yes, that's her name. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. See you next month.